You are my son, but I've done all I can to protect you. The gods smile on you, Octavian. You're a good soldier. I'm a politician. We don't need more politicians. It's not more speeches in the Senate that will change the world. Rome is dying. Why do you think Caesar favored you so? I was loyal. No, Octavian. He saw in you the potential to continue his legacy. Not to follow him, but to exceed him. Antony cannot be trusted. His heart lies in Egypt. We must confront the reality that civil war is inevitable. And how will bloodshed save the people of Rome? You are not meant to save them. You are meant to lead them. All men are troubled when their moment has come. I am not Caesar. I don't have his strength. The people loved him, and they will love you. You can't think like an ordinary man. You must reach beyond mortal ambition and do what has never been done. Survive, my son. Rome must have a master. The month of March 44 BC would soon be over. The legions were in a high state of readiness, and Julius Caesar was expected any day now. He would soon lead them against Parthia. Then one afternoon a messenger arrived with an urgent letter for Octavius, just as he and his companions were going into dinner. A freedman of his mother, Attia, the man was in a high state of excitement and dismay. No wonder, for Attia had terrible news to tell. Writing on the 15th of March, 44 BC, she reported that Julius Caesar had been assassinated at Rome before midday by Marcus Junius Brutus, Gaius Cassius Longinus and others. She asked Octavian to return to her, as she had no idea what would happen next. According to Nicolaus, she wrote, You must show yourself a man now and consider what you ought to do, and implement your plans as fortune and opportunity allow. The freedman confirmed the contents of the letter. A large number of people had taken part in the murder, he said, and they intended to hunt down and massacre all Caesar's relatives. In no time, rumors spread through Apollonia that some catastrophe had taken place, although no one was entirely sure what. After sunset, a delegation of distinguished Apollonians carrying torches and followed by numerous curious bystanders presented themselves at Octavius' front door. They asked, as his well-wishers, what the news was. To avoid setting off a panic, Octavius decided to restrict his answer to the leaders of the group, who, with some difficulty, persuaded the rest of the crowd to disperse. He then told them what had happened, and eventually they left too. Sitting in lamplight, he and his small circle of friends spent the rest of the night talking and talking. What was to be done? One line of thought was to join the army outside the city, Octavius should persuade the army's commander, Marcus Asilius Labrio, to let him lead the troops to Rome, where they would take, advan take revenge on his great-uncle's murderers. The soldiers had loved Caesar and would loathe his killers. Their sympathy would increase when they met the orphaned adolescent. But the cautious Octavius felt that he lacked the experience to carry off a bold course of action of this kind. Too much was uncertain too little known. He decided that it would be better to wait for further news. Soon another letter from Attia and Octavius' stepfather arrived. They advised him not to get overexcited or overconfident yet, but to bear in mind what Caesar, who had eliminated all his enemies, had suffered at the hands of his closest friends. He should, at least temporarily, take the less dangerous course of action and act like a private citizen. The letter repeated Attia's earlier advice of returning to Rome quickly and quietly. This must have struck Octavius as rather odd. Why should Attia and Philippus suppose that their mild-mannered and totally inexperienced son 
should be considering bold measures. It was too soon for them to have heard back from Octavius about any proposal to invade Italy. There was only one plausible answer to this puzzle. His family had heard that Caesar's closest supporters, personal friends and his kitchen cabinet, aides and advisors, were talking about Octavius at Rome and were considering a political role for him of some sort. One or more of them will have written to him, telling him of the bitter gloom in which the dictator's inner circle of professionals have been plunged, and their determination somehow or another to fight back. They knew or guessed that the now leaderless army was enraged and impotent, and that the city mob, after a day or two of stunned silence, bitterly missed the one politician on whom it could depend to protect their interests. What had happened was not a revolution, but a coup from above. You present honest terms. Within a day or so, Octavius decided to follow his parents' advice that he should set sail for Italy. He had become a well-liked figure in Apollonia, and many of its citizens came to his house begging him to stay. He would be safe with them in a dangerous world. When he insisted on leaving, a large crowd ex escorted him to the bay. Octavius had discovered that the legions he had met in Greece were on his side. On his way to Rome, he intended to test opinion among the troops who had been waiting at Brundisium to accompany Caesar across the Adriatic. Having no idea what kind of reception they would receive, a small band of friends made landfall a little way from Brundisium near a small town off the main road called Lupier. There they met people who had been in Rome when Caesar had been buried. This had been a sensational occasion. The dead dictator had laid in state in the forum where Mark Antony, who had briefly gone into hiding, gave a eulogy. The mob, infuriated by the assassination, went berserk. They burnt down the Senate House and looted the shopping malls on either side of the forum, dragging out anything combustible and building an enormous makeshift pyre. Caesar was cremated on the spot. The conspirators, or freedom fighters as they like to call themselves, had had no other agenda apart from their act of violence. They supposed that once Caesar had been eliminated, the Republic would automatically come back into being. Peace, order and constitutional government would resume without any further intervention on their part. This was a disastrous error of judgment, as Brutus and his friends now realized. They hurriedly left the city, where they were no longer safe, and dispersed to their country estates. Hearing what had happened at the funeral, and remembering his great uncle and his affection for him, Octavius burst into tears. The young man now received an even more extraordinary piece of news. Unbeknown to him, Caesar had written a new will during his brief Italian holiday on his return from Spain in 45 BC, and lodged it with the Vestal Virgins, who ran a safe deposit service for important confidential documents. Three days after Caesar's death, his father-in-law, Lucius Calpurnius, read out the testament at the house of the consul Mark Antony on the Palatinate Hill. At the end of the document came the greatest surprise. Caesar adopted Octavius as his son. The adoption was a personal, not a political act. However, Caesar was handing Octavius a priceless weapon, his name and his clientela all those hundreds of thousands of soldiers and citizens who were in his debt. As he must have known, he was giving the boy an opportunity to enter politics at the top if he wished, and was sufficiently talented to do so. The troops at Brundisium came out to meet Octavius on the news of his approach. They, they greeted him enthusiastically as Caesar's son. Much relieved, he conducted a sacrifice and made the crucial decision to accept his inheritance. More letters from Atia and Philippus awaited him. His mother repeated her request that he come home as soon as possible. His designation as Caesar's son had placed him in grave danger. Meanwhile, the fence-sitting Philippus strongly advised him to take no steps to secure Caesar's bequest and to keep his own name. If he wanted to live safely, he should steer clear of politics. All his life, Octavius had been risk-averse. Now, he acted without hesitation. He rejected his stepfather's advice and wrote to him saying so. According to Nicolaus, he insisted that 
he already had his eyes on great things and was full of confidence. He would accept the legacy, avenge the murder of his father, and succeed to his power. This was an uncompromising statement of his political aims, a manifesto he was determined to follow to the letter. Although it would be some months before the legal formalities of adoption could be put into effect, Gaius Octavius styled himself from now on as Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. The name from Octavius to Octavianus signaled a transfer from one family to another, but contained a reminder of his original kin. He soon dropped the Octavianus and insisted on being addressed as Caesar. It was a message to his enemies that if one Caesar was destroyed, another would immediately arise to fill his place. Here was the first great challenge of Octavian's life, a once-for-all turning point, and he met it with calm decisiveness. <laughs>